Orbea is the second notable brand to build their dedicated cross-country race bike around 120mm of travel front and rear, 20mm more than the average XC bike. Despite downcountry suspension levels and geometry that would also suggest such intentions, Orbea are resolute that this is still a race-focused rig. So does the additional travel help or hinder this Basque race bike and how much does the updated geometry play a part? I'll run you through all of that in this video, but before I go any further, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. The oils will be available with two grades of carbon and alloy as well, with prices ranging from £2,999 or $3,299 to £10,499 or the same figure in dollars. I tested the second tier OIS M Team bike, which costs £8,399 or $8,599. This build features a top level OMX carbon frame, which comes in at acclaimed 1,740 grams. The most obvious difference from the cheaper OMR frame is that this version utilizes the lighter flat mount rear brake mount rather than the post mount on the OMR frame. Higher end brakes from the likes of Shimano and SRAM are compatible with this standard, whereas the cheaper models of bike require the use of flat mount to ensure compatibility with more value focused brakes. Visually, very little has changed from the previous version of the OIS, but below the surface, Orbea have made some important tweaks. Tube profiles have been altered to improve stiffness in the rear triangle by 12%, while pivots benefit from larger or double roller bearings to aid reliability. Orbea has routed cables through their own in-house design headset. This, they claim, gives a cleaner look and reduces steering resistance as cables flex less when the bars are turned. The headset also includes an integrated spin block system to stop the bars rotating too far in a crash. At the rear, internal flexible routing guides hoses and cables past the main pivot, with the headset requiring removal to thread the hoses or cables to the bar. The geometry has improved compared to the previous generation bike, with two degrees taken off the head angle, around 15mm added to the reach, and the seat angle steepened by roughly 1.5 degrees. While this doesn't make it the most radical XC bike on the market, it's certainly one of the more progressive models out there. Orbea has increased suspension travel to 120mm at the front and rear of the bike using a flex stay suspension layout. The flex is built into the lower sections of the seat stays, with this area flattened compared to the rest of the tube. The main pivot sits just above the chainring. Those chainrings are 34 tooth from stock, but up to 38 tooth rings can be fitted. A fibre link linkage drives the rear shock that's nestled below the top tube. The linkage is lighter than the previous version, but has been designed to be stiffer too. Both fork and shock are controlled by Orbea's squid lock lever. This gives an on-bar control of the Fox shock's three damping positions and two damping positions of the fork. In the middle position, the fork is left open. In terms of kinematics, Orbea has changed very little compared to the previous generation bike, claiming they felt the suspension performance was as they wished. Obviously, there's some alteration due to the increase in travel, but it's little to write home about. This second tier always tips the scales at 10.4 kilos in a size medium. Obea has added their own Aqua wheels with 30mm wide carbon rims, DT Swiss hubs and Sapim spokes. They're wrapped in my favourite dry weather XC tyres, Maxxis's Recon Race in a 2.4 inch width. Fox supply the suspension, a float DPS shock and a 34 step cast fork both in the factory flavour. With the cutaway chassis of the step cast design, there's little weight penalty in going for the larger down suspensions of the 34. And at 120mm travel, there's no 32 step cast available anyway. Shimano's XTR drivetrain and two piston brakes provide the stop and go. Their top level mechanical drivetrain is the best cable operated drivetrain on the market, in my opinion. The brakes are light and moderately punchy, but the race levers lack the adjustability of the trail levers, even if they do get a fancy carbon lever blade. A Fox Transfer SL dropper with 80mm of travel moves the saddle up and down, while Albert's own OC finishing kit, including a lightweight two bolt wraparound stem, complete the picture, aside from silicon ESI grips. 
Being one of the top end models, the paint job can be customised for free via their Mayo programme. And as with most of the models in their range, there are spec options available if you buy through or Bear's website to help get the bike running exactly as you'd wish. Let's get on to the bit you've all been waiting for, the ride impressions. I rode the Oys over two rides in northern Spain in what can only be called a punchy manner, trying to keep up with some race season pros and semi-pros with my heart rate maxing out on a regular basis. The trails were very dry and dusty, the climbs fierce and descents ridden as hard as I could given the tyres file treads and unknowns beyond the next corners. I'm hoping to get the bike in the UK for a full review on home trails in due course. Let me know in the comments if you want to see a full video review. At the heart of any XC bike's performance is how well it climbs. From the bottom, the Recon Race gives little hindrance. Their central tread is low in depth and closely packed, meaning rolling resistance on smoother surfaces is minimal. Their 120 TPI carcass helps keep weight low, adding to the low rotating mass of the carbon rims. Both contribute towards giving the oils a zippy feel under spurts of power. The rim's 30mm internal width enables moderately low pressures. I was running around 22 psi in the front and 24-ish in the rear in incredibly rocky terrain. The supple carcass seemed to help generate more grip on technical steep climbs than I was expecting, though on gravel drags it was possible to get the rear wheel to brake traction when pedalling with little grace. <laughs> oh yeah, traction on that's good. Surprise, I wasn't expecting to make that. The rear tyre's digging in. There's a bit of movement in suspension just to help it bump up and over those rocks. It's going pretty well. On a surface like this, push hard and you can brake traction at the back, but kind of the way of these real skinny file tread recon race tyres. The suspension feels efficient when climbing. In open mode, there's little pedal bob until you stand up and mash the pedals. Pedaling smoothly results in efficient height gain. I used open mode on technical climbs, allowing the rear wheel to move freely over rocks and steps bolstering the Recon's surprising traction levels. I switched to medium mode for the bulk of off-road climbs. There's still some shock movement to help with traction, but there's an obvious platform that you can feel as the shock compresses. When it moved through this platform, I felt a little bit of a clunk. This helps keep the bike feeling efficient when stood up, as it's not dipping into its travel through pedal bob. It also serves to help keep the geometry as climbing focused as possible. The shock sags less, so the effective seat angle remains relatively steep. On smooth dirt roads or on tarmac, I use the firm position quite a bit, as my legs felt the strain of the high pace. Both fork and shock are put into an almost locked position with no pedal bob to sap leg power. In this mode, there's less traction on offer as it's just left to the tyre to generate grip. The squid lock defaults to locked and requires a push to move into the more open suspension settings. It's a comfortable lever to use and I never found myself mishitting the lever. However, push to open isn't the most intuitive, but should become easier with muscle memory. It's a function of Fox's damper architecture. The geometry of the bike poses no problems on the climbs. The seat angle is fairly steep and so your body weight is nicely centered, while hips are placed well over the pedals. The front end length is roomy and there's ample room to move forward and back to regulate traction and direction. The key development on this generation always is the addition of 20mm of travel. Overall, it's difficult to see downsides at this point. The weight of the bike is still competitive, the packaging of the travel doesn't hamper the geometry, and more travel just means more wiggle room when things get technical. Aubert seemed keen to add that it's the lightweight nature of the Fox 34 Stepcast fork that allows this. It's a fork that I also saw recently on the Giant Anthem, which has 110mm of travel at the front with 100mm at the back. More on how it compares to the Giant in a moment. On descents, the extra travel is most noticeable when you really rattle it through technical sections. There's not so much travel that the bike feels vague or squishy, but hit an unexpected drop or square edge and the extra travel gives you a little bit more safety. The Oiz's pedalling performance uphill contributes to how this bike feels on the descents though. Though the rear end is plentiful in travel, it isn't the smoothest ever with the rear wheel often skipping about, especially under braking, and there is some pedal feedback. This is the obvious compromise with having a more stable pedaling platform though. On the other hand, it was rare that the bike became a handful to control, 
nor did it lead to discomfort on the long 60k marathon ride we did one day. In comparison to the giant anthem, the Oise is better at pedalling, whether uphill or along the flat, but not as smooth as the anthem on descent when both bikes are left with their suspension open. In this sense, the Oise has a pretty classic feeling XC back end. Geometry wise, Orbea has done the right thing. A traditionally shaped XC bike with more travel would still feel sketchy on technical terrain. By lengthening the front and slackening the head angle, the Oise is a confident and competent descender. The rear triangle has been kept short at 432mm, so at no point did the Oise feel reluctant to change direction. But aim it down a fast, rough trail or tip it into a steep corner and there's plenty to like. Okay, so this bike's about two degrees off the head angle of the previous one, so it's about 15mm longer in reach. And that, on the descents, makes a palpable difference to how it feels. I've ridden the previous one a bit. This one is more confident, it's more stable, and consequently a bit easier to go a bit faster. At the back, it's clearly like a race device suspension platform, so it's not the smoothest I've ever ridden. But the payoff of it scrubbing around a little bit over bumps and lumps is that the pedaling performance up the hill is better. While I love the recon race, it has its compromises. Braking traction isn't the best and cornering on loose surfaces can be exciting. However, the slight shoulder tread that the tyre has makes a massive difference to cornering traction on all but the most marginal terrain. In terms of the rest of the specification, the cockpit felt good, though there's a hint of harshness through the form of damper. Fox Transfer SL Post is a slick performer that doesn't have infinite travel. I occasionally found myself waiting it too early on its return stroke, pushing the saddle back down to the bottom. Shimano's XTR drivetrain was faultless, but I would have liked a touch more power from the front brake had it been available. So those are my thoughts on the updated Orbea Ois, and now I want to hear yours. Did they make the right choice in adding that extra travel? Let me know in the comments. If you're looking for even more XC goodness, why not check out this video?